all of who I was in life up until my dad died was a repercussion of wanting him to love me. Well, it's it's awesome to talk to you again. I'm sorry that we're talking over another book inspired by a heartbreaking tragedy. It seems to be my specialty, I think. This one's a, a little closer to home. I'm I'm uh, I'm very sorry about your loss. Oh, it must have Ryan. been must have been very difficult to write. I mean, obviously talking about Maddie in the first book, it's sad, but it's 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 not your family. It must be something different, right? Yeah. Well, uh, the overlap between how I felt writing Maddie and how I felt writing this, there's there's a lot of similarities because people would ask me about Madison Holleran's story, the student athlete who died by suicide and working with her family. Well, that must have been a dark place to live in. And my reality was that writing about people's humanity made me feel closer to my own and to theirs. And, sure. and I think similarly writing about my dad and his death and ALS, similarly, both experiencing his death and writing about it made me feel closer to my own humanity. And so it actually wasn't, it wasn't a dark place to live in. It wasn't a dark place to be. It was, and I'm lucky for this, but it was very beautiful in many yeah, ways. Yeah, I think, I think people think that writers sort of have it all in their head and you're just like, you're, you're putting down this sort of, uh, ironically, uh, authorial sort of view of the universe, but you're usually sort of figuring out what you think as you write. That's what, that's what writing is. So I imagine getting to spend all this time with your dad, both when he was alive and then after he died through sort of trying to figure out what he meant and what was important to you was also a, a, a that's what, that's what the beautiful part was, was really figuring out what your dad meant to you, not in just an emotional place, but in a place where you had to like articulate it on the page to a stranger. Yeah. And I had, I loved my dad and I was close with him, but I'd never thought this much about my dad as in the year of writing this book. In fact, since the book came out, I'd say it's been the hardest time for me because I was with him. And even though he was sick and there were many incredibly difficult parts of that illness and his death, and then I'm writing the book and I'm basically reliving our life together in writing the book. And so there wasn't, it wasn't like the on, I kind of almost put a dam up from the onslaught of grief. Not that it's been an onslaught, but I got to live with him again. And even in, like you say, I mean, the book in the, in the book, I'm peppering all of these life lessons that, that I learned on the basketball court. And if you're reading it, you could think that in the moment my dad mentioned something or taught me something that I had this very uh, wide lens view of what it meant. Yeah. But a lot of those lessons only exist because of long walks I took after his death and thinking through how those lessons actually have applied to my life or how they could apply to people's lives. And so you're completely right in that it was the thinking in that year of writing the book that maybe really expand what my dad meant to me and and the things he said and did and try and make them into a big picture kind of philosophy. And I feel like as an athlete, and I found this with the athletes that I've talked to, they kind of have, they have this knowledge, but it's often like in their body. So it's not like in their mind, so they can't articulate it. And it's only with reflection that it comes out. I, I remember I was reading about uh, Jack Harbaugh, so John Harbaugh's father. And there was something that he would repeat like every day when they would, he would drive him to school and he's like, we're going to attack the day. And it was something, mm-hmm. some like cheesy dad thing, you know? And uh, he, the, the kids hated it. They always groaned their eye, it rolled their eyes and groaned. And then it was like 30, 40 years later, one of them gets a job and he's doing a press conference, like announcing the job. And he repeats like this thing that his dad had said, uh, that he, he had never repeated ever before. He'd never acknowledged in any way. And that's when the dad, it, it, it hits Jack Harbaugh like, oh my God, they were actually listening. And they were listening, but it was at like a different level. And it took 40 years for it to like bubble up and be 
sort of repeated for the first time. And so I got to imagine there was a lot of the stuff your dad told you when you're on the basketball court, when you're driving, whatever, it, it, you absorbed it, but you didn't actually process it until like now. Yeah. Okay. And that's, that's really interesting too, because as someone whose background is the beat, I was a beat writer for the 76ers for three years. Mm -hmm. And so the, the hardest part of that job was attempting to get athletes to explain in an interesting way, the movements that they make that are ingrained in them on the basketball court. And it was almost impossible to do that, to get them to have any sort of perspective on why they do what they do or how they do what they do or what it means in the larger sense, because that's not, that's not part of what being an NBA athlete is until, like you said, you sit down and, or your, your job, like my job as a beat writer was to make sense of the movements that they make. And there, I never thought about this before you asking that question, but there was a direct parallel between watching NBA players struggle to articulate why they do what they do and spending a year trying to look back at the very athlete like mentality that my dad had and extract a larger meaning from it. Because there were many things that he said, like, for example, you know, he taught me about the, the, the little notch in the middle of every free throw line in the world, you'll find this little indentation that completely marks the center piece center of the line and of the rim. And my dad did not mean this as a kind of Zen philosophical <laughs> right. point of view about the world, but I certainly started to live it that way. But it took me the three weeks of writing that chapter to actually articulate what that feeling was and what those movements actually meant in a larger sense. No, that's beautiful. And I do think athletes have, well, it, there's that idea of there's different kinds of intelligences. I think there's like supposedly seven kinds of intelligences or four, I forget what it is. But the idea when you talk to, like I found this when I've talked to athletes and then I've talked to uh, like hip hop artists, two demographics that uh, I would say historically were, were, were uh, deprived or screwed over by the education system, right? So, so they often will lack uh, what you and I have, which is a lifetime of practicing, explaining exactly what we mean and articulating it. Um, that doesn't mean they don't have the exact same observations about reality and they're not seeing everything that's happening. They may actually be experiencing a lot more. It's just, they don't have the practice of communicating about it. So you have to, you have to, you have to find a way to get at that. And it's often beautiful and done through sort of unexpected analogies, like you just said, because they're not, they're not dealing even with the same point of reference of reality. So they find a way to communicate it. Like, yeah, find the notch in the free throw line. That that's like, that, that is a Zen observation. If you're like me, you grew up eating the sugariest, most unhealthy cereal you could possibly imagine You can't even wrap your head around how your parents allowed you to do this. And now that you're older, you want to eat healthier, you want your kids to eat healthy, but you still love the delicious taste of cereal. That's what I love about Magic Spoon. It's high protein, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, wheat-free, totally delicious. I just absolutely love it. 13 grams of protein, only five net carbs, zero grams of sugar. It's just the best cereal. I don't eat cereal in the morning most times, but I do have it for dessert a lot of days. Just absolutely great. We pick these wild blackberries on our farm. I eat that in there, but check it out. I think there's free shipping with your order. You can use code Ryan Holiday. Thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video and this podcast. Seriously, it's legit delicious. Yeah, it is. It's completely a Zen observation, like so many of the things that my dad said. But to the point you're making, I think you're right in that having, you know, grown up, maybe being forced to write essays that the point of it was for me to like analyze some situation in a meta way. And that start to be that 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 cultivated in me an idea that that's how I saw the world. And maybe some of that was a class issue and some of that was just the way different intelligences work. But what was really interesting to me, even in writing this book, was even the process of writing it and the way my brain works was so clearly different than the way my dad's brain worked. Yeah. And all of like these basketball lessons that I take to mean so much more 
I would be shocked if my dad meant them as more. <laughs> like, <laughs> sure, sure. He, he obviously just meant make your last dribble the hardest because it's better going up into your shot with momentum. And I'm the one trying to like extract some large meaning from it. And it is a very different, it was very different getting, trying to get into my dad's brain because it, it worked so much different than mine did. Well, and, and yeah, I don't want to be condescending about it. It may actually be a much better way to live. Like, you know, yes. uh, you'll talk to an athlete and they'll be like, you know, I just went out there and did my best and you got to, you know, thank God or something, you know, they'll, they'll like sort of repeat these like cliches, like the sports cliches. And like, for, for a writer, you're like, oh, you can't do that. That's a cliche. But they actually mean it like that. Yeah. They're they're actually operating on a level often of um, uh, presence and earnestness yes. that that like as a writer or as a as a, a literature sort of based worldview that you're like you're not allowing yourself to operate. Like I loved yeah. your dad's mantra when he gets out of bed in the morning, like I would, I would never allow myself to say that out loud. I would feel too awkward, but like, yeah. it's probably a much more joyful way to, 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 to attack the day. Yeah. Well, so one of my, the favorite interviews I ever did when I was at ESPN was with Abby Wambach. And we were talking about the header on the cross from Megan Rapino at the 2011 world cup against Brazil. It's like this famous sports moment that kept the U S from being eliminated in the quarterfinals, which would have been their earliest exit ever in a world cup. And now in particular, the U S women's national team, they know that if they advance far in a world cup, I mean, that's millions of dollars per, per player in a way that a, U, a, a different soccer team at the world stage, like they still have their premier league team, you know? So and sure. I say this to say that the pressures in that moment are ex extreme for a female player because of what it might mean long term. And yeah. in talking to Abby, I'm like, well, you must have been thinking all of this, right? You're you're at the World Cup, you're on you're on the field and you're thinking it's the 111th minute. And if we don't, you know, equalize, get an equalizer like you. Your, your whole longevity and your whole ability to make it right. So I'm taking her through a meta awareness of that moment. Yeah. And she's like, oh my God, no, I never thought any of those things. I was thinking about, she's like, I was just alive and the grass was green. And I was just thinking I had to, and I'm like, wait, you never thought to yourself, what yeah. are people thinking as I, they're watching me? And she's like, I could never do that. Yeah. How could I ever succeed if I did that? And I was like, well, that is why, I would have failed in that position because I am constantly analyzing how the outside view of what I'm doing will be seen. Yeah. Like the, I just went out there and did my job or it was so beautiful to just like play as a team, you know, like yeah. I think you may actually have to operate at that level because the, perhaps it's impossible to be physically and mentally at equal levels of awareness. And maybe you have to tune up one or tune down another to operate at that level. I think that's exactly what, what Abby was, again, an athlete who yes. would not have been able to articulate it like that. And not to say that, I mean, I think Abby Wambach is brilliant in ways that are completely, you know, tangential to ways other people are brilliant, but you're exactly right. And that what she was getting at was that to be perfectly physically in tune and aware to what my body needed to do in that moment, I could not take any energy to consider the TV audience on ESPN and what they might be thinking about the U.S. team or what endorsements I might not get if we had lost that game. It, so it's like completely tuning down the meta awareness and completely tuning up like the in-body experience. And that is not something that I don't even know that she's she's probably doing it with practice or it's more of her natural state, but it didn't seem like something she was controlling. It was like a default state that she'd gotten herself to. Yeah, like uh, I was talking to Stephen Pressfield who wrote The War of Art and he talks about like the muses. And I, I'm like, you can't possibly believe that your artistic stuff is coming from the muses. And then on the other hand, it's like, that's probably a, a decent coping mechanism to not overthink where the hell all this stuff comes from. Like, again, when you, when you hear an athlete, thank God, or, you know, thank something other than themselves, it, it may be part of the same thing, which is like, 
you can't be too self-conscious of what you're doing or you won't be able to do it as well as if you are just in a flow state connected with who you are and what you're supposed to be doing in that moment. Yeah. And I think the flow state gets you to a place where you realize that you are not fully in control of every thought and every good idea that comes into your mind. Like they're coming from somewhere yeah. and it's easier to kind of to say something like the and, and I, I do actually ascribe to this idea of like not muses in the way that our culture, you know, suggests them, but muses in the way that I can't conjure them. Therefore, I'm not fully in control if they don't show up either. <laughs> right, right. And and to think that you're fully in control and that this is all you is probably actually an unhealthy way to do it and yep. puts too much pressure on yourself. So it's it's a way of like not staring directly at the sun. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so So you're also an athlete though. So where does this come from in you where you have the ability to do both, where it seems like your father was sort of fully identified as an athlete his whole life? Well, I think, I don't know if this is why, but my dad seemed to have been born to be an athlete in that he loved it and it was the thing that made him, that, that made him feel complete. Like he played basketball up until and through his ALS diagnosis until he physically couldn't do it anymore. And I never felt that way about sports and I never thought sports were like my, pa my full passion. I didn't feel fully alive when I did sports. Like, cause I think that, I think that when, when I talk to somebody like Abby Wambach, not like she's obsessed with soccer and she loves it forever, but that she, sometimes when she plays it, she can forget who she is and she can go into that state where you lose time. I never really was able to achieve that in basketball. I am able to achieve it in writing. And so I, I think that's where my dad was able to achieve that in basketball. And I was not that person. Can you be great at sports or anything without that thing? Do you think is, is that like, cause you were good and you made it to a certain level, but not the Abby Wambach level of, of, of basketball. Do you, do you think that that was just, just the, you know, just like some people are born two inches too short. Do you, do you think that's what it was for you? I think that the main, I don't think I ever could have been great like WNBA, all-star great. But I do think I could have played at the professional level if I hadn't had that attribute. If I was more, if I could lose time playing and I was passionate about it, I think I would have been better. I, I, I think that when we talk about the all-time greats of things, this is, this is me thinking on the fly here, not something I've like <laughs> studied, but... I think when we talk about the all-time greats, they probably have the perfect mix of all of those things. Yeah. I don't think that you can be an all-time great and not think that that sport is somehow your passion, whatever that means. Not that you're not going to fall out of love with it or have times when you don't want to be doing it. Those things will still exist. But I think that you are able to lose time when you play it. I think to be an all-time great, that needs to be true for you more often than not. Yes. Yeah. Like when I talk to people who are thinking about doing books, because I'm sure you have ideas or you see things that could be good books all the time, but you can really only write, I say you can only write the ones you can't not write. Yeah. So like it, it has to be something that it would be physically painful not to do. That's the yes. only way you're going to get something great. Like um, you had to write this book, right? Or there was something about Maddie's story that like you had to solve by writing about it. And then all the other books that you haven't written fall in the other category. Yeah. Or the, I think there are people who write books and they just write them because like that's convenient for them then. And I yeah. don't think, again, if we're, if we're making the comparison to like what separates the all time greats, like a Kobe or an MJ, I think it's, you can't not do this thing versus I'm doing this thing because it's convenient. Cause I think there's plenty of books that exist because, all right, well I have to do something this year and this was a yeah. good idea and I'm writing it. But I think there's a difference like this book for me, all the colors came out is not that it's not, well, I had this year free yeah. and I guess I'm, a, I guess I write books. So I guess I'll write this idea. No, this was like, this was my collision of both 
love and dedication and voice and momentum and motivation. It was like a collision of all of those things. Well, I think that makes for the best stuff. And weirdly, the, the, the stuff that allows you to sleep at night, because obviously you want this book to be successful, but to a certain extent, because of what you just said, that it exists is the first victory or, or is a form of success that's totally up to you and totally on you that really no one else could have prevented. Like you wanted to write the book. You, Rick Rubin just tweeted something about this, that the day your thing comes out, like you've already succeeded. And I think yeah. that's true. The only caveat I would put on it is like, unless you didn't do your best. Like if you had to write this book and then because you were distracted or you were afraid of being vulnerable, you only gave it like half of what you knew or you held something back, then it could be a failure, I suppose. But I think when you do something that you can't not do, by nature of doing it, you've won. Un unlike sports, which like the box score at the end determines who won or lost. Yeah. And, and writing this book for me was, I guess my through line of this conversation with you is Abby Wambach, but yes. it was my Abby Wambach header against Brazil moment because it was really the first thing I'd ever worked on that while writing it, I was fully present and joyful at the writing of it. Whereas other things I'd written, I spent a lot of time Googling bestseller lists, wondering if I'd make them or like, look, you know, when you're writing your first book, you're spending most of your time like looking at agent message boards or something, or you just spend more time wondering what the product of your creation will get you rather than really living in the writing of it. And this was the first book I'd written where I was fully satisfied at the end of every day, just taking a walk in my neighborhood after having written whatever words I was going to write and actually saying out loud, oh, the process of writing is the victory. And the process yeah. of writing this story is the victory. And that was my very much, I'm on the field and I'm taking joy in the moment and I'm not worried about the, the outcome or the validation that comes on the back side of it. That, that always comes later. That always comes later. Once you, once you publish, you can't help but worry about that. But, but there is something to be said also, I think, for having, having had done, done those things. So, you know, Maddie was a number one New York Times bestseller. So th there is also something where you can feel a little bit satisfied having crossed those things off the list. And then you can go like, okay, I've arrived. I don't really have to prove anything. And I think it actually generates better work because like, as you said, all you spent an, we all spend a not inconsiderable amount of energy focusing on those external things, which is by definition energy you're not spending like in the flow state making the thing you should be doing. So there's a cost to it, to, to the wandering eye. Oh, yeah. The, in the same way that the other, you know, thing you, I'm sure you've, you've talked about a lot is like there's a cost to checking your email while you're on the phone call with mm -hmm. somebody. And I can see that I can feel that cost when I come back to a conversation that I'm having while I'm checking my email. And I have I, I don't even know what the cost is, but it's probably, um, you know, tenfold if you're writing a book, but you spend 30 minutes Googling the bestseller list like that. That's a that is a cost on it. But one one thing I've one one reason why I think this book in in particular feels different to me than other books is that like I it's not it and this is going to be counterintuitive like it's not timely in any way mm -hmm. it's not it's not built around a cultural phenomenon that is particular to 2021 it because a lot of books are created that way like what what will people care about in 2021? Are they going to care about these three topics? And I guess I'll build a book around it. I mean, this book, you know, is it's tough to get people to pick it up because it's there's no reason to talk about it on June 24th versus any other day of the year. And it's really sad or people think it's sad based on the topic. And I don't think people gravitate toward wanting to deal with that, especially after a pandemic. So I feel like, anyway, I feel like all those reasons make it 
obvious it was the right book to write for me because it, there was no other motivation than writing it. Yeah, the, there, and I've, I've experienced that with some of my books where um, the downside is, yes, there's no news hook or news peg, as they call it. So it's not timely. But the upside uh, is that it's timeless, right? So, mm -hmm. so you, you, on the one hand, you don't have as favorable conditions. And yet, over a long enough time, you actually get sort of more, I don't know, at bats or you, you, have, you have a longer runway. Uh, I'm getting ridiculous with the, the analogy, but the, the <laughs> It's it's better because it most books have an expiration date and and then when you write something that connects to something that goes to what makes us human, um, it could be relevant fifty years from now or a hundred years from now. There's a beautiful book um, called um, I'm 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 now forgetting the name. Uh, but John Gunther, who was like one of the great journalists of the 20th century, like the, the uh, like 30s, 40s, 50s, he wrote this book about about his son. I want to I want to find the name um, whose son was dying of cancer or something, his younger son. And he wrote this beautiful book about it. And it's like I'd never heard of John Gunther. I'd never heard of his son. It was no longer a news story. And you read this sort of heartbreaking book as sort of a letter from a father to a son about trying to capture this this boy's life, this brief life. You know, the upside is that it's completely timeless and it it's it's impacting people far after both of them are gone. Yeah. And I think about that a lot, even in terms of the my first book, What Made Maddie Run. Even though I think it has a, a long sh shelf life, it's not timeless because. It's, it's about, about social media. It's about a specific yes. time and place. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's not like it's like a three month window of accessibility for people. But I don't think in unless as a historical artifact in 2070, are people going to be picking it up except to think, oh, wow, that's what they that's how they responded when social media first came out. And I think about that a lot in terms of all the colors came out in, in that. There's nothing about it that pegs it to 2021. It, it is very much just a human story that I think would be will be relevant whenever. And uh, at least there's there's hope on my end when it comes to the universality of the story I'm trying to tell. Yeah. So I, I found this book. It's called Death okay. Be Not Proud. It was written in 1949. I pulled up the Wikipedia page. L li listen to this sentence. This sentence is incredible. Uh, so it says, soon after the book's release, Dorothy Thompson, who's apparently a uh, oh, she's the first American journalist expelled from Nazi Germany in 1934. Anyways, she says, has his had his son lived to be 90s, uh, lived to be 90 and had his achievements filled encyclopedias, he could have made no greater achievement than this transmitted by his father to show us what on its highest levels of courage, serenity, tr serenity, truth and beauty, a human life can be to show us that as we live, we die and that life and death are one. Oh, man, that's amazing. I mean. Other that's than your the book title, is about. that's essentially what my book is about. But other than its title, which might date it to 1940, yes. <laughs> other than that, that is exactly that is the timelessness that I think all the colors came out has. And I don't mean that in like a egotistical way. It's just it, it by nature of the story being about the decisions we make around death and when loved ones die, and the honest conversations that hopefully we're having, and the honest. And the thoughts we have that sometimes seem unsavory to us, but are universal. I mean, all of that to me is a, is a universal story. It just happens to be about a father and a daughter who grew up loving the, the nineties Knicks, you know, that that's the specifics of the universality. <laughs> well, so one of the things that was kind of timely uh, about your book that, that I wanted to talk to you about, I was reading, I think a piece in the economist and it was saying something like, one out of every five families is estranged, like a son or daughter is estranged from their parents or, or vice versa. Um, and they didn't really explain why this was, but it was striking because your book kind of talks, it's not that your father and uh, you and your father were estranged, but as you got older, you kind of drifted apart. You weren't as close as you were at the end of the book. I, I mean, obviously that's one sort of message of the book is to sort of be with people while you can be with them. But I was just curious, what 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 do you think when you hear that statistic? Well, what what comes to mind for me is that 
I, 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 I'm surprised that that number is so high actually, although I, it's not like I've read a lot of data on estrangement. Yeah. Um, but what, what comes to mind for me is the fact that the estrangement that my dad and I had, I think is more common. And that is that we still talked all the time. We just avoided anything important or yes. deeply meaningful. And so when I talk about the relationship with him, it's not, it's not a physical estrangement. It's an emotional estrangement. Right. Because he, he would call me twice a day. He'd always call me when he got in the car on his way to work. And we got in the car on his way home from work at a minimum two times a wow. day. Wow. So, I mean, this guy liked to be in touch. <laughs> so there's, there's no part of our relationship where I'm, where it meets the, the technical definition of estrangement, except for the fact that when you look at the childhood we had up until I left from college, there was so much more of a, of a closeness, an emotional closeness, a willingness to be vulnerable with each other. And I think the story I'm trying to tell is one that so many people can relate to in that it's one of those relationships in life where you've known for a long time that something's missing and that there's something that has happened. Maybe you've said or done something that you want to reconcile and apologize and get to a better place with this person, but you, you're not quite sure if the thing you feel is real yeah. or if it's a figment of your imagination or if they feel it too. So it's like, it's a very nuanced kind of estrangement if we're going to use that word. And I think it's much more common that people experience it this way rather than we haven't talked in 10 years. Although one in five is is actually a lot. <laughs> yeah, the, it, I think it's partly a boomer thing too. I saw a meme the other day that was something, the, the effect of it was like, uh, your parents are telling you some, like, you know, the, the neighbor three doors down just put in new flowers, like, you know, a, a, the, the neighbor three doors down's cousin just put in new flowers in their garden. And then it's like, you also find out like a month after it happened that your mom fell down the stairs, broke her arm, and it's now has like 15 pins in it. You know, like like this sort of weird sharing and and focus on things that do not matter at all at the expense of even the most basic personal information uh, or to, to say to say nothing of emotions or vulnerabilities or fears or, or worries. Yeah, yeah, to not even get that deep as that. Yes. These are just like exchanging just and I and, and I didn't maybe it is a it is a boomer thing that you're talking about this idea of of just like arcane details that are happening in the neighborhood and being and being shared but the the thing that I've come to realize going through this with my dad because I still have people in my life who are engaging with their parents in the way that that you talked about and it seems to me that that behavior is motivated by sparing people yeah. or not being a burden on a loved one or, or, or a kid. And the one thing that I will always be grateful to my dad for am among a lot of things that I'm grateful to him for was that he didn't come to this disease to, to ALS and the process of it, believing that I had to be separated from it to either spare me or spare him. He was very, he was very much from the beginning. And this is, this surprised me because he seemed to, he seemed like he couldn't be vulnerable about things. But when it came to the physicality of the disease and the emotion that the disease brought, he very much wanted me to be a part of it. And I, I will be grateful for that because I think that when people, when people separate their loved ones from what they're going through, they're actually keeping their loved ones from what can be a very emo a positive emotional experience to be present for someone going through something like this. Yeah, there's that expression, you're only as sick as your secrets. And I think uh, a lot of people are very sick and they keep secrets about things that not only like are not shameful, but like would be very helpful to everyone involved with that we would share, you know, like, like finding out, oh, hey, there's this rampant uh, history of drug addiction or mental illness in our family that by not sharing, you make the kid uh, 
face this thing totally alone and think that they're the problem, right? Like, I, I think this is also, I think one of the messages of, of what makes Maddie run is like um, on both both sides, like parents pretend everything is fine. And then when the kid really struggles with something, they have no support network, no frame of reference to be able to share mm-hmm. what, what to, to, to be able to notice that something's wrong. And then yeah. conversely, when something's wrong, they don't feel safe or uh, good sharing it because they don't know how it's going to be received. You have to create like habitually over the course of a life space where this stuff can get talked about because the one time you don't talk about it, that's, that's, that's the thing that changes everything. Yeah. Well, that's an, that that is a, a through line between those two books that I hadn't even connected being that what made Maddie run and Maddie's family not communicating openly about mental health issues that were running in her family, which Ryan, like you said, leads her to go to college. And when she starts to battle her own depression, she thinks, what is this thing? I have no idea what this is. I have not, to me, it feels like, you know, Maddie saying to herself, this must be something that's going to go on forever because I have no frame of reference to say, well, I know people in my life have gone through it and gotten to the other side. And then on top of that feeling like the problem is her rather than actually, this is something that we, that runs in the family we could talk about. And so I think that idea of like, but that takes vulnerability. And, Mm -hmm. and in similarly, I think when it came to my dad, it took vulnerability to be able to say, I'm so sick and how sick, not that he could have hidden. I mean, you can't hide ALS, but you can, but you can shut yourself away. And a lot of people do do that because the disease makes you you know, physically and emotionally at times, someone that you don't recognize, you don't recognize yourself in the disease. But so the idea that he could be vulnerable enough to say, I'm going to let you in and see me when I don't even like who I am, that took a level of vulnerability and they're different vulnerabilities. But if you don't, if you're not open to them, right, not open to speaking about things that run in the family or not open to this idea of letting your kids in and again, I don't, that's not to say every caretaking, every every child who's caretaking is always a beautiful experience because it's not. Yeah. yeah. But I think being being open to expressing the vulnerability that he had was a gift to me that he was willing to do that. Well, and this is why I like Brene Brown's work because you keep saying as uh, vulnerability, the 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 other way to define that would be it was immensely courageous, right? Like it takes. Uh, we think of courage or strength as the ability to just sort of grit your teeth and bear it, to sort of to suffer silently, to put on a brave face for everyone. But actually, the courageous thing for your father was to let you in, to to be, to allow himself to be seen as uh, something other than the person he'd wanted to be his whole life, mm-hmm. or worked his way to be, and and. And, and the reason this is so important is that it's a it's a, an incredible gift to you and the people around him who in the future will suffer and go through things and need help or need to be vulnerable. And you have an example of someone having yeah. done that. Yeah. And on a very like, you know, on a very almost like quid pro quo level, it's like I was there for him. And so yeah. then when I'm sick, I won't think, well, I should just shut myself away. Yes, because that's the model that has been shown to me is that you should you shouldn't ask for help from your loved ones. It's almost like I've paid into it now, mm-hmm. <laughs> both the emotion of it and the physical nature of it. I've I've paid into it. And I and I know now as I get older, like there are things I learn that I want to ways I, I want to behave when I get sick that he very much either showed me or taught me or opened the door to me feeling. And the interesting thing about courage in all in this was like his his decision to let us be a part of it even though he didn't feel like who he was like the big strong tall dad anymore that was one level of courage and then the next level of courage was him being willing to being willing to surrender to death because there was a period of time in which he wasn't and he thought he was being courageous by like continuing the fight and, you know, no weakness, no surrender, all of that belief system. And the rest of us in his life didn't see 
didn't see him continuing the fight against ALS as a courageous thing. We started to shift and be like, actually, the most courageous thing right now is to realize like the impact on your family, the impact on, you know, the collateral damage all around you and the winless battle and and bow out gracefully to use all of my sports cliches. And that was kind of the final step of of courage is we're not we don't always have to like battle until the bitter end like that doesn't always have to be the way. Well, and final step, it's sort of the ultimate thing, right? I, going back to Cicero, Cicero says that to philosophize is to learn how to die, that that's what we're all doing. We're all over the course of a life learning how to do the one thing that we all have to do, the one thing that all humans have shared for all time. And yeah, it seems like in a sense, by allowing you in and the real gift that your father gave you all and then you know gives the readers by 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 opening up to a writer is that he allowed you to experience and struggle with the struggle that we all have which is being afraid to yeah. die yes and i mean that's the the through line of the book while in part being like life lessons that were taught through the game and then life lessons in that last year of his life as he's in the final year with ALS, like I'm trying to show a portrait of an, of an athlete, which is a different mentality than other mentalities. It's, it's very much a portrait of an athlete. Like you said, working through the mindset of who he wants to be and how he's going to one accept death and then approach death. And for much of the book and the story, he is unwilling to do so because he just, he sees it one as I think he sees it as failure to some degree that he's giving up. Yeah. And then, and then and of it's course losing. it's just, it's losing. It's definitely in his mind for much of the book losing. And then there's just fear on a very primal base instinct of fear. Sure. And it it's not until the very, very end that he starts to realize that surrender is what he needs to do. But the complicated thing about, you know, the book is that by the time he realizes this, he has completely lost his voice. So there's, there's this section of time where I, I'm, I'm very, I'm almost desperate to know what it's like for him. Cause aren't we all just so curious of sure. when someone is finally looking at death and, and has co- come to philosophize to the point that they are accepting that death is going to happen. I want to know why and how and what that feels like, but he couldn't talk anymore. And so was trying to piece together small things that he was doing and ways in which he was communicating by blinking and trying to, in my own mind, as the writer of this story, piece together what he must be feeling and thinking and what it all means. What do you learn from like how he lays there and how he holds his head up and, and yeah, uses his eyes? What, what, what do you feel like he communicated with you about the hardest thing that we all have to do? I think what was the, what was most compelling to me was that the, so so the, the very unique way in which he died was that we decided to take him off his, his ventilator, his tracheostomy. So, but we had about 48 to 72 hours before the hospital was willing to transfer us and make this happen and have all the paperwork done. So it was almost like, I mean, in a, in a way he's almost like a death row, right? He, he knows, he knows when this is going to happen, but we can't do it yet. So he has this chunk of time. And it was really interesting to me, the things he was bringing up, because even though he couldn't talk, he could, he could mouth something and we could try to read his lips or we had a system where he could, you know, left eye was yes, right. eye was no. And the night before we transferred him to the ICU to start the the morphine drip, which would end his life. He, he was really, he was really forceful about translating this one sentence. And when I finally got it translated, he, the, the sentence was, uh, the the fight outside CVS and it was this fight that my dad and I had had 15 years prior in Rhode Island and it was the biggest fight we'd ever had outside of a CVS and 
it, it was about a stupid thing. Doesn't matter now, but like we'd really gotten into it. And it was really compelling to me to, to see that the point that he brought this up a second, I, the second I said, the fight outside CVS, you know, he blinks his eye. Yes, yes, yes. And then he mouthed, I'm so sorry. And it just, I was like, we all think that at the end of life, we're going to be like reminiscing about the weddings and the vacations and, and, and deaths of other people. But like, that was something that had given our relationship like texture. It was this thing. And and that's what he was thinking about in these final hours was like moments in his life that he maybe he hadn't communicated properly and he wanted to go back and just make sure I knew as I kept forward in life that I knew that he too wanted more from our relationship and that he too had made mistakes. Um, and so it was very compelling to me, not that it's not common sense that we want to reconcile all of these things, but that very specific thing we'd never talked about since the day it had happened until the day before he died. Well, and obviously I, I didn't know your father, so this might not be what he was trying to say, but I think the other part of that is, you know, we think, and we, we say this, like when you were thinking about leaving ESPN, you know, we go like, am I going to regret doing this or not chasing my passion? Am I going to regret not going to this opportunity to do X, Y, and Z. We think we're going to regret things that have to do with like pleasures that we didn't take or roads that we didn't take or things that we didn't do. But in reality, you know, I think what we end up regretting is the times we lost our temper about things that didn't matter, that we regret the way we treated people that we cared about and the way we treated them wasn't a reflection of what we actually felt about him. So I, I I wonder if what your dad was, your dad didn't want that thing, which is so meaningless in retrospect, to mean anything mm -hmm. years later. You know what? Like he did he didn't want he didn't want that to go unaddressed because it it didn't matter, but it at the same time it mattered so much. Yeah. Well you're you're definitely spot on because it was the last thing I remember it was the last element of our relationship that had been conflict that we hadn't talked about since he'd gotten sick. Like there had been other mistakes I'd made, decisions I'd made that we hadn't talked about that over the last years of his life, I brought up or he brought up and we talked through and we both got into this place where we're like, that's done. You know, it's, that is that no more holds any power in how I think about you or how I think about our relationship. But the but the fight outside CVS had gone unaddressed. Yes. And and it was still, I assume, this thorn in his mind about, OK, well, we talked about this thing. We talked about that thing. I regret that. I regret that. And we had gotten it all out except this one thing. And you're completely right. And that nothing in those it was such a fascinating case study of like those last 48, 72 hours, like the things we were talking about. Yeah. The, it was just it was just reliving memories, all, you know, reliving memories, reliving stories and making sure any thorn that had existed got pulled out. And it was all yeah, relationship always. Like I, I think about like with my wife, like let, let's say I was to list like the 15 biggest fights that we've ever had. I don't think there's a single one that I'm like, I would still die on that hill. Right. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> right. none right. of them matter in retrospect. Right. And so we get so worked up about things and then they, it becomes this sort of feedback loop. And then all of a sudden, yeah, you're having a fight outside CVS and 15 <laughs> years later, it's, it remains unaddressed, you know? Yeah. And I think death yeah. puts all those things in perspective. Yep. And that was what we were watching him do was putting everything in perspective. And he and yeah, it was very courageous that he did that because he could have shoved you all away. He could have shut down. He could have focused on the pain that he was feeling or the 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 biological struggle that he was in. But instead, he went at a higher level and l left a, a, a legacy in that sense. Yeah, and, and we have we have stories now that we tell or jokes that he created from those last forty eight hours, right? Like the, this, like. Sure. Just 
you know, you can imagine as someone you're trying to read someone's lips to glean what's insightful to them in their last 48 hours. But you're also going to have some mishaps in that in that process. Yeah. And even that even that process and that community that we had in those last 48 hours is now a legacy that he yeah. left because he decided to not he decided to show up in those last 48 hours in the best way he possibly could and engage and be present and want to share with us as best he could by lip reading and winking and staying awake as much as he could like the things that were mattered to him and now we now we have memories that come from that that are beautiful yeah it, it's the Stoics would probably love the absurdity of it, though, and I, I hope this isn't making light of it. But that no. one, one, one gets to this horrible place where you are deciding to die, right? And what does it say about life and modern life specifically that um, then the holdup is is uh, bureaucratic paperwork, that administrative <laughs> work then determines when you're allowed to leave uh, life on this planet. Yeah, it, it's it's not funny now in retrospect, but I'm grateful for those 48 to 72 hours. But the comedy of my dad, finally, after like putting, going through so much with ALS, finally saying, I'm surrendering. It's best for me. It's best for you. You know, and, and we'd had, we had to lip read him saying, I want to die. And then we have to go back to him after we meet with everybody in the hallway you know, the doctors, the the hospital administration, we have to go back to him and say, so it's scheduled for Monday. And, yes. and meanwhile, it's Friday. And so, <laughs> so just the amount of frustration that he had to be like, so now I have to live with the knowledge that I'm going to die on Monday. That's a special kind of bureaucratic bullshit that has to happen. Yeah. You, you get to a place where you say, I want to die. I'm ready to die. And then the lawyers say, not so fast. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't look so good for us. We have to clear all the red tape. <laughs> um, have you read the the Springsteen uh, biography, Born to Run, his his autobiography? There were two, and I read I read the Bruce one by um, Carlin. Oh, so I, I'm talking about the autobiography, the one that Bruce wrote. I think I've read both, but I only know for sure that I've read one. But 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 go for it anyway, because I'm a big I, I Bruce just, fan. <laughs> I was just thinking about it because there's so many Bruce Springsteen uh, quotes in the book, and I was thinking about this scene in the book where where uh, I think it's Clarence Clemens, the the saxophone player, is, mm -hmm. is dying of cancer, and that sort of the whole E Street Band is there in the hospital room as he's dying, and they so like sort of what's what's one last song that you want to hear? And they all play uh, Sandy, like 4th of July at Ashbury Park. And, yeah. I, and, and I, when I remember thinking that, I think about it all the time whenever I hear that song, I go like, that'd be a good way to go. Like just like of all the songs surrounded by the people that you love, that you worked with your whole life, to hear a thing you participated in making, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty, I mean, I, I don't know why Sandy in particular compared to any other of the E Street Band songs, but it does have a nice like melancholy undercurrent. Yes, that's what I it. mean. Yeah. yeah, you wouldn't, yeah. you wouldn't, you wouldn't go out to like Born in the USA or something, right? Like it, it, that, that's not mm -hmm. the right. Um, and, and Darkness on the Other Side of Town or something, like you know, that's not. But there, there is just a sort of a, a like at the end of it. That, I don't know. That there's something that, that struck me. I, I don't know why I thought of that scene when I was when I was reading the end of your book, but that something about that song struck me as as and then the, the scene of, of of him going out to it. Yeah, no, actually, I think that that song, Sandy, is very representative of what the energy of the last 48 hours with my dad was, because there's like the sadness undercurrent, but there's the the reminiscing about the beauty of life. Yes. And and that song is a, a, a from what I remember of Sandy, I haven't played in a couple of years, but it's very much about a relationship and and love in a time and place. And so all of that wraps up into a very nice little microcosm of life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's a yeah. it's a song of nostalgia and love that's gone. And that's yes. what. Yes. Um, I had I had a couple other questions, sort of related to this, but but that I thought of lessons from the book. So you talk about the decision to leave ESPN, which we talked about when we talked about last time. But I then reading this book, I, I 
saw another layer on it, which is your dad, you said your, you, your dad loved you working at ESPN more than you did, or it was more important to have you work at ESPN to your dad than it was for you to work at ESPN as far as identity goes. And there, there's been parts of my life where I've noticed, like, I go like, man, I sort of checked off a bunch of boxes. Why these specific boxes? Is that because I chose them? Like, am I interested in X, Y, and Z because I chose it? Or did I not even inherit that? Did I pick that target because I wanted something from these people? And do, do you find that that some of the things, whether it's even basketball, that 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 that's, you did things because you wanted a connection with this person that was maybe there all along or that you should have gotten other ways? I think that that is accurate, but like one layer removed in that I think I started playing basketball because I adored my dad and I wanted to spend time with him. And that was the thing he was doing. Therefore, that was the thing I was going to join him on. And then I was going to practice and get better at it because he could be by my side doing it. And I think that making those choices when I was just a little kid, yeah, then very much led me on a course where sports became the de- defining characteristic of my life. And then that led to after college pursuing sports journalism because I already had this background of having played with my dad and then played in high school and played in college. And then that leads me to ESPN. And so all of who I was in life up until my dad died was a repercussion of wanting him to love me. (laughs) Yeah. But, and he did love me and he liked me a lot. So it's not like I was chasing after some love that wasn't there, but it, and and then the, the older I got, the farther away I got from like what I really wanted. And it was more like, well, this is an echo. It was a nostalgia. It's like an echo of a choice I made when I was eight. Yeah. Like, I mean, seriously, my career at fan was an echo of wanting to make him proud on the basketball court when I'm eight years old. Yeah. And, and I think that that is not a bad thing, but you do lose when it's that far removed from what you actually genuinely are in love with or care about when it's that far removed, it's time, it's time to like reassess and, and refocus on like, okay, now that I'm, you know, at the time I was 37. Now what does 37 year old me want? Not as an artifact of eight year old me. I think this is why Gatsby is such a beautiful book and and why it's resonated now for almost a hundred years. Is there this idea of the guy trying to get either back to a thing or try to capture this thing that you can't possibly capture, you know, sort of the, the boat beating ceaselessly back against the current. That's what we're all doing. Sometimes it's trying to go back in time. Sometimes it's trying to bring someone back from the dead. Sometimes it's trying to win the love of someone that you should have had inherently naturally never had to earn maybe it's not love you know because as you said you know your parents love you but it's usually like pride you want them to be proud of you so you end up orienting your entire life around trying to earn something that by definition should not have to be earned and it's kind of the trap the beautiful tragedy of a lot of high achievers yeah and and the thing that comes off of it is for me that I now, I don't think there's any way to reset if, even if I wanted to. You and can't become a doctor is. now. Yeah. And there's like, there's no way you can unprogram me from being an athlete and with that past and those skill sets. Yes. So it's like, so yeah, I leave ESPN to go help my dad, but like now I, now I work at Metal Arc Media, which is started by the former president of ESPN. And so it's like, it's not as if that experience then reset me completely. And I'm on a completely different trajectory now because you, I think you can try to shape, reshape the experience of your childhood and like bring in things that are more in tune with who you are now, but it's, but it's still the skill set I have and who I was at nine is still programmed in there so deeply. I can't get that far away from it. I feel. Yeah. It's like you still do the same profession, but you want to get to a place where you're doing it from 
a place of fullness as opposed to emptiness. Like emptiness is if I win this award, if I become this person, then mommy or daddy will be proud of me or love me or whatever. You you sort of you have to get to a place where you're like, okay, this that is independent of what I do professionally, even if that's why I entered the thing to begin with and realizing that no amount of accomplishment, nothing is uh, ever going to get you that. Um, and that you have to do the thing because you're like for the pleasure of doing it or because you like doing it or because you're good at it or because it's lucrative. Or, you, you have to find a new reason to do it because yes, the, yes. the old reason is, is a, a heartbreaking reason to do it. <laughs> yes. The old reason is um or when people you know and this might be just be a movie trope but like they're marrying someone to piss their mom off like yeah. these are all things that people do and thankfully m- my form of this was more oh my dad loved a sport and so I played that sport which is which is I think a thing that probably a lot of people can relate to whether it's a sport or an instrument or something like that but I still can't get away from that I I I I, I can't I can only within the skill set I have and the things that motivate me, try to find, try to find projects within that field that I feel more fulfilled by, like you said, than, than what I entered. My motivation entering was probably more like, Oh my God, but it's everyone thinks sports are so cool and I'll be super cool to my dad and to everybody if I do this thing. And that's not sustaining. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So last question for you. So uh, when I was wrapping up the Malcolm Gladwell interview, I decided to touch the third rail and talk to him about vaccines and sports. So I wanted to touch a third rail with you, which is something that I've seen you tweet about it. So I, I'm curious, um, what is, I, I'm trying to understand the logic of it because I, 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 would, I would identify probably as sort of a centrist, maybe a little bit center right but there's so many people that I know that are sort of conservatives or Republicans that are that are good people and, and and compassionate people, sort of love thy neighbor people. Why are people so worked up about this transgender sports issue? Like I, I'm trying to think about it from the perspective of like I get why transgender people care about it. It's very important to yeah. them. I can't understand why someone who has never given a shit about women's sports ever before in their life suddenly has very strong opinions about who should be allowed to be in women's sports. Well, I think I, the way I saw this form as someone at ESPN and now, now paying attention to these, to these topics in sports, it started first as the like North Carolina, uh, anti-gay bill that that got passed and then there was one in Indianapolis and in Indiana and like even the the NBA all-star pulled out of Charlotte one year because yeah. of like a bathroom bill and it seemed as if in the world of politics it was like this let's get everybody on board for these bathroom bills yeah. and then those didn't seem to catch on And it seemed to me as a political talking point to pivot from bathroom bills. Okay, that didn't work, but we need a lightning rod issue that will galvanize everybody to one side. And you could slowly see it over the course of a year or two pivot to trans issues in sports. And then the rallying cry became defend women. So one, from a political perspective, you could see it go from okay, well, we're not galvanizing enough momentum and drawing enough people to our side with the bathroom bill. It's not working. Let's pivot to trans issues in sports. And I think that's working right now. So there's there's that yes. whole piece of it to begin with. That's kind of what has happened. There's the larger question about, okay, well, even though I don't think this is a problem right now, as someone who pays attention to sports, I think there's like, you know, you could you could come up with maybe two incidents where you're like, maybe there's some fairness questions here, Yeah. but it's not an actual, like it's not an issue right now, but I I will allow for the fact that over the next generation or two, it's something we need to understand how we're going to, you know, respond to. I think the question that I, that I think women's sports has right now as a protected class of sport is that when we defined sports, you know, it was like, first it was just sports and then, our, our, our culture evolved and we're like, well, we want women to play sports too. Therefore we're going to have a classified part of sports, which is women's. When we did that, 
gender non-binary and 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 transgender in sport wasn't even a conversation. So right. we might have defined sports differently if 40 years sure. ago gender non-binary was more of a conversation topic and trans issues in sports were being talked about. We would have said like, well, let's define this category differently. And that yeah. so I think so I think now we're in this place where we're like it's women's sports and we we've defined it as such. I think we need to have a redefinition. So that's my perspective, no. having watched it evolve. No, I'm glad you said that because I think that's something that thinking sort of good people have to be really careful of, which is let's say there's a certain amount of just like dark, toxic energy out there that human beings are capable of, right? We we're suspicious, we we have you know, racial biases, we have, you know the repugnance or disgust we feel about things, that there's a darkness in human beings and it's usually directed at things we don't understand, things that are different or whatever, right? And when you do something like a bathroom bill, where that fails is it's like, who gives a shit, right? Like I remember there was an SNL uh, joke where it's like, you know, you can just go to any bathroom you want. There's no like police, right? Like no one polices the bathroom. Yeah. He, was joke he was joking that you're sort of like enforcing a thing that, you're writing a log about something that would never, ever actually be enforced because like people go to the bathroom for two minutes and then it's over and the, the crime, the crime has been committed and it's uh, possible to, to have stopped. So um, that dark, the dark energy was manifesting about something that wasn't palatable. So it didn't get any resonance, but the sports thing, uh, every uh, people have kids People are hypersensitive about advantages between their kids and other yeah. kids. And so it's kind of like that thing where we're like, if, if, if you, uh, let's say 40, 50 years ago, if you express some overt racial bias, maybe people would have said, hey, that's gross. Uh, but then where manipulative politicians would come in would be like, obviously, you know, people should be treated fairly, but would you want one of them to date your daughter? You know, like it, it's, mm -hmm. so it's taking the disgusting, horrible energy that you shouldn't devote, you shouldn't uh, indulge. And it's finding a way that it makes it more palatable, socially acceptable. So then it can be a wedge, then it can manipulate people. Then it can make you do something that's bad, but that you could still look yourself in the mirror and be like, I'm not a bad person. Yep. And that right now is how what, how I see the the trans and sports issue is a wedge issue. That it's a political wedge issue that is being the the dark energy. It's shifted yes. to that, and now it's you know it's now it's the rallying cry. Um, so because because who would who would become transgender to get a slight edge in women's sports? You know, like I mean, it's a preposterous accusation. <laughs> It's preposterous. And it's very similar to as someone who pays attention to these things in sports, like one of the last bastions of, you know, misogyny, racism and sexism that that you can that you can exhibit without being called out is just by outwardly aggressively hating the WNBA. Like if you're going sure. out of your if you're going out of your way, yeah. responding on Twitter, like if ESPN puts up a post like you know, uh, Tina Charles of the New York Liberty scores 32 and you're going out of your way responding to that tweet by saying, get back in the kitchen or who cares. It's right. the last place where you can just be misogynistic. You can place your misogyny or your racism or your homophobia and closet it behind. I just don't like the WNBA. And I think that there's right. a lot of issues in sports that exist like that, like this, the trans issue in sports, like, it, it's not really about, quote unquote, defending women's sports. It's about your own fear of the unknown. Yeah. Or, or it's really the idea that like men and women are not like that as a man, uh, the, the idea that men are superior to women is culturally not an acceptable idea to discuss or to, to put out there, except the idea that men are better than women at sports. So the joke about like, you know, men will say like, oh, I could play in the WNBA or, or whatever, right? right? That, that's, right. You, you wouldn't say, oh, I could be a better CEO than, you know, the, the, a female CEO of a, of a Fortune 500 company, but you can, it is culturally acceptable to talk about how you're a better athlete than women because historic, or, you know, uh, the, some of the, the times of male sprinters are, or female sprinters are equal to, you know, X, Y, and Z, uh, the, the yeah. course, an unequal corresponding male time. 
Yeah, the biological athleticism of of men is superior to women. Therefore, if you want to take that to its natural conclusion, then you've got guys now saying that they can beat Sue Bird in one on one because yeah. they played in middle school, which is really just their way of exerting their own, like whatever inferiority they might feel and threat they might feel by just the mere existence of the D- the WNBA. But but the, the the trans issues in sports, like it's not that I'm positing that it's not something we all need to who are involved in sports. We need to be thinking hard and deep about it. Cause I mean I heard Malcolm talking about, you know, like the obviously three percent in sports is a huge amount. Yeah when it's in running or swimming. So if you're saying that testosterone levels are at a certain place and someone's only having a marginal advantage, it's like, well, that, you know, the Olympics are about margins. So it's not as if I don't think we need to be talking about this. I just think that we had the thing I said earlier, like these classifications that we've created were created in a different time period. And I don't think any of us, like, an answer to this question isn't, well, some people won't be allowed to compete. I, I don't think that that's a place we want to get ourselves. Um, so I think we need to really start thinking long and hard about how we're, how we're reclassifying what, what sports are and how we're going to Olympics to WNBA, because even the, this is an issue, even within the WNBA with gender non-binary and transitioning and how, how the WNBA is even going to classify itself. It's so strange, too, given that we just sort of came off, that's a weird way to say it, but that that culturally or or, or globally, we've come to an evolution as an understanding of of gay rights and, and, and what it means to be gay and what it means to go through that, that like people's instinct on this transgender thing is like a suspicion uh, or, or like a uh, an anger towards the the people, right? As if they're like trying to pull one over on you, as if this is like a thing that they are like wanting to do, or or that it's like an adva- I It's it's weird that our default reaction is like a is like a defensive one when really it mm-hmm. should be an empathetic one. Because if you think for two seconds about what that experience is and what it must be to be a minority of a minority of a minority, I don't think your reaction is like, how do I prevent this person from doing what they're trying to do? You know what I mean? Like, because not only are the stakes like pretty low, but like from a human being perspective, like I, I don't, I don't, it's, it's striking to me that our reaction is such, such a negative one when it really should just be a like, that must be very hard. Like it must be very, yeah. very hard to be you. So, what do you need? Well, yeah, I, I, I do, and it's, it's almost like a cliche to suggest like media messaging. But I mean, I when I growing up, I saw Joanna Man. Like that was a Hollywood movie about sure. about a guy pretending to be a, a woman so he could dominate in the equivalent of the W, the WNBA. And a lot of our, I mean, a lot of our media around trans issues is pretty bad. I mean, go back to, go back to like Silence of the Lambs, go back to Psycho. I mean, the, the portrait we have, the, the portrayal we have about, about like trans women in media is one that like, it's almost like a default inside our brains that like, oh, you should be. Like this is a dangerous, scary situation, and yeah. that has been happening like in 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 movies and in storytelling for a really long time. I didn't think about that. Yeah, so people have sort of been programmed that it's this like yeah again aggressive or deceitful thing. When of course, even if it was based on deceit, because I mean, yeah, let's say uh, people are pa- trying to pass. Um, they're not trying to pull one over on you. They're trying not to get beat up by strangers. Like yeah. it, it's a, it's not, it's so interesting that we, we perceive minorities asking for what's theirs, like what everyone is, we see that it, it's like that joke about how when you're used to privilege, you know, equality sounds like uh, a step down, um, that, that we perceive what they want as, as zero sum. 
you know, when yep. it's not zero sum at all. It doesn't affect you in any way. First off, because you don't play women's sports. Second of all, because you don't watch women's sports. But third, because like when things are better for other people, they're better for, for everyone. Yeah. And I, I know this is completely, we're off on a topic here, but I'm fine to be off on it in that we can say that for people who are casually paying attention, they can say, well, you know, trans trans issue in sports, like, well, let's just, let's just no trans people can compete. Well, well, what are we going to do then about like intersex athletes? It's not as if it's, it's not, I'm not saying those, those are the same yeah. thing, but I'm saying this is all about a classification and it's all based on the premise that like sex is always binary and yeah. It's just not. So we're either going to live, we're either going to live in a world in which we say, well, we created sports as binary based on like the idea that we all said and perpetuated that sex is only binary. And like anyone who falls into any kind of middle ground, like we just don't have the capacity as a society to deal with it. Like, are we, we're either going to be that society or we're going to say, well, let's, let's actually go back to the drawing board on this classification of women's sports and see how we can restructure this. Yeah. And there's a thing from a media perspective that I think people miss, uh, that it's worth pointing out. There's this thing called concern trolling. Do you know what that is? Yes. Um, where, where you pretend to be concerned, but really you're just using the fact that the other person will care that you're concerned against you. Like I remember I was, I did a Fox news interview not that long ago. And like, so, you know, you have to watch like the segments before you're on. And uh, the segment was about some law in California that allowed like prisoners who identify as this or that to go to the prison of their choice. And it was all about how now all these vulnerable women, female prisoners will be exposed to people who are pretending to be women. And it's like, first off, is there any evidence that anyone has ever done this? But I was like, second, like, since when did you care about inmates in prison? Like, you don't actually give a shit, right? Like, uh, you yeah. don't give a shit at all. And now all of a sudden you're white knighting for these female prisoners in California. And it is, I'm not saying it's not an issue. You do have to decide, like, how you protect, you know, people in prison. And uh, are, are there prisoners who lie to try to get certain advantages and do fucked up things happen in prisons? Yes. But, like... You're concern trolling right now to mm -hmm. use this as a wedge issue to keep people divided. And I think it's hard for people to recognize sincere anxiety and worry and sort of that dark energy anxiety and worry, which is designed to make you suspicious of someone or some other group. Yeah. Oh, just one more quick addition to that, because it's like most um, even going back to the bathroom issue. Most trans women that I know and having, you know, looked at this issue and read it a lot, like most trans women will go out of their way not to go in a public bathroom because they don't want to make they, they don't want to be in that situation. They don't want to make women in the bathroom, cis women in the bathroom uncomfortable. So most most trans women will like make sure they use the restroom before they go to an airport. So that they're not putting anyone in a situation where there's discomfort. So it's like the fact that we're trying to pass a bill f a about this thing that you think is going to happen when the people that you're passing it against are purposefully trying to spare the feelings of cis women is like it's it's all back to the dark energy that you talked about. Yeah, no. It, yeah. And it's it's sad that whatever we have going on as a society from a media incentive standpoint to a, you know, like a polarization standpoint that like that dark energy is like kind of the through line of all our conversations for some horrible reason. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Because the dark energy causes you to click and read about it. And <laughs> those are the advertising yes. incentives. Yeah. And so, so whoever can manipulate the dark energy best. Yes. Yes. And both and both sides do do it. Right. Because yeah. uh, anger is a viral emotion. So so in the one hand, someone's using the the wedge transgender issue to, to get attention. And then the other side is using the reaction about what the fucked up thing the other people are doing to get attention. And then we're all missing the fact that these are 
human beings who constitute like a minuscule percentage of the population that present a threat to no one who are, by the way, just trying to be fucking happy and figure out how they can do (laughs) the best at whatever it is that they feel like doing. It's not, it's so insane. Yep. Yep. Well, let's, let's not wrap up on that note. Let's wrap up on the book. Any, any, what do you feel like coming out of this? How, how, how did going through what you went through shape who you've what you've gone through over the last year let's say like coming out coming it's sort of you got i guess you you know when it rains it pours you went through this thing with your dad and the pandemic and then now whatever this weird half reopening uh normal life thing that we're in how, how has this changed who you are and where you're going so the book and well and and just taking time with my dad it it completely shifted how I think about career and life. And, and by that, I mean that I'd, I definitely adopted this idea that like life is tracks and like, you, you gotta, you know, if you get off, we have that saying like, Oh, you got off track. And it insinuates that there's like a singular track that we should all be on. And it just has really opened my eyes to being being able to step back and step away. And that doesn't mean that you're either moving backwards or moving away because I leave ESPN. I spend this time with my dad. I feel like I'm a better version of my professional self than I was before. And so it's it's really I'm not sure how I'm, I'm going to apply it yet, whether I want to be someone who maybe works for you know, uh, three years and then takes a year off. You know, I, I just, I want to do something differently than assume that the point of my life is to get back on the ladder or the track and then move forward for the next 15 years until, you know, well, hopefully I have that long live. My mom okay. gets sick and then I have to learn the lesson again. Like, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not waiting for any other time period now. I, I don't, I, I'm not buying into the messaging of that careers define you and that you should be. And I know you've talked, I think you've talked to Tim Ferriss about this a lot. Like if there's some other life you're waiting for, then you're, you're doing it wrong. Like if this, you're doing this thing so that someday you'll have this thing. I don't want to be that person anymore. Yeah. And, and you already live in a small town, sort of like me, although Charleston's bigger than, than where I live, but, uh, yeah, the the job transition, the uh, where you live transition, I think when when we're looking at these trends now of like raising house prices in all these new places and, uh, you know, uh, employers having trouble hiring people, I think people woke up, you know, June or July of 2020 in the depths of the pandemic and they were like, I fucking hate where I live. I fucking yep. hate what I do for a living. Why am I going to keep doing this? You know, yeah. it's not an incentive. So it's not incentives. It's not like, oh, you know, wages haven't been rising enough. Although let's say that's true. That's not why people are suddenly quitting their job and moving to Montana. It's that they were like, they got a, they got, they got the kind of perspective shift that you got going through this thing with your dad, where you have to step back and look at your own life from a slight distance or moment of stillness. And you, you go, I don't want to do it like this. Exactly. Yeah. You, and and it's like the emperor has no clothes, if I'm using that metaphor correctly. Like, we all told ourselves, like, what would happen if work, if we weren't working? Or nothing. what would happen? Nothing, nothing, it, nothing happened. I mean, obviously, people kept working. But for this kind of, like, the the career achievement, obsessive workaholics, you, you'd think the world would stop if you stopped doing your job. No. And so that, I think I got that perspective from my dad and then the pandemic on top of it like I don't I'm not here to work that's not that is not what I'm here to do and that is a completely different shift than I than I had before no that's beautiful and then yeah your dad shows that you don't even know how long you're here for so you should do it while you can yeah that's well this is amazing I'm so glad we got to talk I love the book and uh this this is the galley because I read it in the galley form but uh awesome as always 